All right, guys, I am so sorry that this video took so long. I have had a really big problem with uh, my internet service. It is one in the morning and I'm going to make sure that I get this video done for you guys so that if you are still up, which you shouldn't be, which if you've watched my past videos that were meant for my students, um, I suggested that you should be asleep right now. <laughs> Um, I literally just got a comment from James Cruz asking where is the video. I'm working on it right now. It's not necessarily going to be an hour, but I'm going to do some quick hits and I'm going to go through only the short responses because from my experience of doing this for 12 years, you guys do pretty well on the multiple choice. It's on the short responses where you lose a lot of points. So I'm going to concentrate on the June 18th, 2019 Living Environment exam. This exam had some funny questions that I personally didn't like as a teacher grading this, but the most important thing that you need to remember is how do you make connections? Never leave anything blank. Use logic, take your time. You have three hours to do this. This is a one-shot deal for some of you. Um, and if you're taking an August exam, that's most likely means that you either were absent for the June 18th exam, you were sick, you couldn't go, um, or you failed the June 18th exam, or you want to be ahead of the game and your school is allowing you to take the August um, exam just to see how you do, or you're taking it to see if you can get a higher score from the previous test that you took. Maybe you got a 69 and you want to go for a what they call college ready grade, which is from a 75 to an 85 or above. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to get my trusty pen here. And we are going to go straight down to. don't need my pen right now. I have to scroll down. So I really think that with you guys practicing the multiple choice questions, you should be okay. Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of the topics that you need to know for, for the exam, the short responses. So here we go. Once you're done with the multiple choice questions, right? The first thing that you have to do is a graph. I don't know what kind of graph is going to be in August and, and tomorrow, well, in the test that's happening in, what, 12 hours, 6 hours, I don't know, I can't look at the time right now. It's super late, finally got my internet back. Um, quick thing, I can't upload a 45 minute video on a hotspot, which is what I had. Uh, it would literally take 3 days, so forgive me, please forgive me. But please make sure you're watching this in the morning. Okay, so you're going to start with a graph. It's either going to be a line graph or a bar graph. Remember that you have to read the um, directions. The directions say from numbers 44 to 55, um, for those questions that are multiple choice, record on the separate answer sheet. Please be careful with transferring your answers as well. Um, I had a student who answered 43 as 44, and then all of the answers after that in terms of multiple choice were shifted. So every point counts. Every single point counts. So here we go, guys. So here we know that we have a data table, and every graph has a story that it, it's talking about some kind of experiment. What you need to do, you need to annotate. You have to annotate, underline, um, write your version of what they're talking about on the side, but also see what do they want from you. So you go to the directions, always read the directions because they tell you what to do. Teachers can clarify questions, but they cannot help you with the answer. You can't ask them, what does this word mean? You can't ask them, is my answer correct? Is my graph correct? Um, so here it says, so we need to distinguish, is this going to be a line graph or is this going to be a bar graph? And just to let you know the difference, a bar graph is when you do the, uh, let me just make sure I have my pen here. 
bar graphs usually look like this. You have some numbers here, okay, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you have some things here, some numbers here. Um, it, it could be anything. It could be a scale. And then you will uh, look at the ta data table and make bars. And of course, fill them in and according to your data table. So um, a line graph, you would have, you know, to make your scale. And you would have some kind of line that connects the points uh, together, okay? So let's re read the direction. So the graph, ha you're gonna graph just two points. Every single question is a value of one point. You are not leaving anything blank. You leave something blank, the teacher can give you the point. You never know if you can get it correct. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of the to-dos and my pointers because that's in my other videos and it's just becoming repetitive. So, okay, so let's do this graph. So, this says mark an appropriate scale without any breaks in the data on each labeled axis. So, we're gonna go back to the um, data table and we are going to also minimize this so that we can see. Can I minimize this while I am recording? No. <laughs> Let me try. No. It's okay. So here we have time, and we know that this is an x-axis. This is a y-axis, but you don't even have to know that. They don't even care if you know what an x and y-axis is. But you should know what it is because you also have to take algebra. So don't, you know... Just know this is the x-axis, is a y-axis, but they labeled it for you. What they didn't do is that they didn't put the numbers that belong here for you to make your graph. So let's go up and let's see. Let's start with time. Let's start with the x-axis. Okay, here we go. We have 0, hours, 6, 18, 30, 48. Are these times in a perfect kind of pattern? Does it go by six? Does it go by threes? Does it go by twos? No. It's just random numbers from lowest to highest, from the beginning of time to the end of when this experiment ended. So you have to make a scale that makes sense to the graph. So your lowest number is zero and your highest number is 48. So here, let's see how many spaces we have. This is always going to be zero, okay? Always. So here we have zero, and then how many spaces do we have to put numbers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so if we take 48, and we divide it by eight, we get six. I just divide, I just, took 48 and divided by six. Um, if you cannot do math during an exam because you're super anxious and you just can't do it and you've always worked with calculators, one, you gotta try to you know not use a calculator because you will have standardized exams that won't allow you to use calculators, but you are given, you are supposed to have a calculator for this test. You will have some very basic math um, like what I just did you need to make sure that the school supplies you with a calculator. If not, find your Hello Kitty or your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle um, non-graphing calculator and take it. Make sure that you go prepared with what you need. So remember that what you need is a pen, a pencil, um, eraser, sharpener, calculator, and ruler. And I have all of those things of what to do and what to bring and what to eat, what to not eat in my previous videos, which you should check out uh, because there's still time because the living environment exam is in the afternoon. Yay, you get to sleep in a little. Um, remember, sleep is important to retain information and memory. I just learned that from a Columbia University program that I'm in. Back to this. So we have six spaces. So we can go and work by six with the um, y-axis. Now I don't want to do, I don't want to do that just yet because I want to figure out time now, okay? 
uh, because of the scrolling back and forth. Okay, so now with the Y axis, oh wait, I should have the same, my bad. Oh, I just made a mistake that you could have done and my, my previous students have done in the past, which is they put the numbers in the wrong spots. So I counted this, but what I did was time. So we go by six with time, right? And then, but it belongs here in the X axis and I was counting it here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm still gonna have enough space for time going by six. So now time is labeled here. Time is labeled here, okay? And these numbers, you're gonna make a perfect scale and put the time here, okay? So now, here we go, population. This is gonna be our y-axis. Look, these numbers are very, very sporadic. They're all over the place. And we have to figure out what scale are we going to use. The lowest number that you have is two. Notice how I didn't even read. I didn't read anything yet. I'm just going and attacking this graph to what they want, the, what the data table says, and do they want line? Yes, they want line. And we're gonna make our graph and then we're gonna answer our questions pertaining to the graph. These are two easy points, so don't miss them. Sometimes graphs can be like for up to five points. Um, sometimes it could be two lines that you have to make. Sometimes it could be a bar graph, like, it could be a very complicated graph and it could be a simple one like this. But this is where students kind of mess up. And this is where teachers get a little funny on giving points because some, some teachers are very strict with grading um, graphs and other teachers uh, follow, you know, teachers are supposed to follow the grading that they're supposed to do that the, the regents, the state regents tells them what to give points and what not to give points. But some teachers, secret between me and you, are sticklers and they don't give points if they feel like your skill just isn't good enough for them. Um, a little controversy there, but anyways. Okay, so our, our lowest number is two and our highest number is 37. So we need to see how many spots we have. And this is population. So we're going to make our scale highest number 37 in population here. So let's take a look. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 spots. And the highest is 37. So 37 divided by 8, that's about 4.6. So we can go by 5s. We can go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And that's okay, that's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. So we're gonna go by six here and we're gonna go by fives here. So let's work this out. Um, in terms of the data table, I am going to just quickly um, have this on the side and um, you can follow along. I really highly suggest that you print out if you can, if you have access to a printer, uh, print out the exam or have your cell phone out, have your like two different devices, have a, a desktop and a laptop or a desk, just figure it out. Double screen, have the test in front of you um, so that you can look back and forth. So let's get to it. So I'm gonna have, if you listen, I have my printed exam. And I'm going to start doing the first question, which says mark an appropriate scale without any breaks in the data on each labeled axis. And when they mean by breaks, they mean like, this is what they mean, that you start, let me just get my pen, that you start here at zero, and then you have a break, and then you're going to start here like 250, 255. 260 and you're going by fives um, as you go up but you had a break here from 0 to 250 that's what they mean by break so um, so yeah let's do our graph 
So here, population, I'm looking at my data table. Population has, um, it starts, we always have zero here. So this, this is zero, and this is zero. This right here. Don't put zero here, and don't put zero there. Don't put zero in the middle. This is where zero is, okay? So um, we have zero. And our highest number is 30. And I'm going to plot my points. So if you have the data table in front of you, I can't go back and um, show you because if I do this, this whole thing erases. So what it's telling you to do, it says on question 45, let me read it to you. Plot the data on the grid provided. Connect the points and surround each point with a small circle. If you don't put that circle around the plot, you don't get the point. So you've got to make sure that you um, plot it and then do the circles and connect the dots. Do not take, this is not slope, this is not algebra. It does not say to do a straight line. So you connect from dot to dot. So let's plot, let's plot everything. So time does start at zero so there will be a scale here a plot here so at zero zero time population was two so two would be like around here so i'm going to do a little dot here um and i'm going to leave it alone i'm not going to do this circle yet i'm just concerned about plotting when the time is at six hours the population so now we're here six hours the population is 4.5 4.5 is about here at 18 hours i know i have 12 here but i'm looking at the data table okay the data table says now the next time is at 18 hours the population is at 16 which is about here Next time is 30, so 30 is here, and population is 28, so we're going to follow it up here, and 28 is about here. And then 48, at 48 hours, the population is at 37, and 37 is around here. If you feel like you could do this better, like this scale better, because this one came out kind of perfect, um, if you can do the scale better, you know, do it. As if it's correct so now we're going to add our circles okay we're gonna add our circles around the plot now we're gonna connect the dots starting from zero working your way and this is where I suggest that you use a ruler okay use a ruler something happened here rule ruler Okay, I guess my <laughs> computer is slowing down like me. It's now 1.30 in the morning. And I'm doing this to get this from you. This is why I'm doing this. Let's see if it comes out. Nope. I was writing past. But this is what I want to see. And a diploma in four years if you're a freshman in one year if you're a senior so let's move on so that's that was our graph so this question were, would will pertain to the graph crap and I erased it but it's okay once you have the graph you would be able to answer number 46 so let's um, let's move on to the next question so after the graph you are going to have um, some random multiple choice questions and short responses mixed in. And the thing about living environment is that it doesn't go cohesive. Like, you know how you started at the beginning of the year in cells and you ended probably in ecology? So that's not necessarily the way the, the test flows. It can jump from um, from ecology to reproduction to cells and back and forth. But again, the most important thing that you guys need to do is to make connections from 
what you've learned in reproduction and connections and how does reproduction connect with evolution, by the way? How does evolution connect to natural selection? How does natural selection connect with mutations, DNA mutations? So, okay. So here we have um, what we call a phylogenic tree, which shows ancestry of a species that um, is like an ancestor that gave that gave different types of species as time went by so um let me get my pen back so phylogenic trees are usually more like something like this like a family tree where you have an ancestor then you have these two species then these species and then this would be the past and this would be the present time, right? So this is not the way it's oriented. It's oriented on its side. So this is, you can say this is a vertical and then this is a horizontal one. So before even going into the questions, it's so important that you guys take a look at the diagrams first. What are you looking at? Okay, we have um, dinosaurs over here a bird, crocodiles, and you know that phylogenic trees um, talk about relationships and how closely related certain species are to each other. So let's break this down. Over here is the past. How do you know? It's down here. This is back in the day when we had dinosaurs roaming the earth. Isn't that incredible how we had these huge, massive animals just walking around the city of New York, like, if there was dinosaurs documented to be on, I, I don't know. I don't really know the history of dinosaurs. Um, I should know. But anyways, here we have the past. This guy over here is an ancestor. Please work, pen. And I'm forever in my videos I'm gonna have an issue with the pen okay guys just follow with me this is the ancestor as time went by um, we have these different species the present time if it today 2019 okay 2019 that's this the ones that are at most edge, at the edge, at the tip. This is the present time, okay? This is not the present time, so this guy is extinct. Extinction happened to this guy. This guy is extinct. This guy is extinct. These guys are dead. That guy's definitely dead, okay? So the ones that are living still are these, uh, the crocodile and the birds, okay? So let's take a look, what does the question want? Now that you've broken this down, and, and you do that to all the phylogenic trees, you do that first, even if it's a multiple choice question. Don't look at the question, don't look at the multiple choice, try and see if you can figure things out and paint a picture, a story in your head, and then go to the question, all right? So now let's take a look at what do they want from you? What do they want from you? So question 48 asks, identify two groups of organisms from the diagram that still exist on Earth today. Present time. Describe how they may have been able to survive to the present. Okay. Common sense. Use your brains, guys, because you are smart. You get intimidated by the wording and the question. Relax. Go to the bathroom if you have to. Wash your face. Have a snack with you, that snack that I advise that you get and you put in your pocket. It could be a granola bar, it could be anything. Nothing junky, okay? If it's gonna be chocolate, make it that dark chocolate, not that sugary, you know, caramel stuff. Um, so anyways, let's, let's get to work here. Okay, so Identify the two groups of organisms from the diagram. You're not making things up. Things are here for you. The answers are here. We just said it. The ones that are living till present day, present day, keyword, is the crocodile. 
I'm going to, um, for time's sake and for my sanity with this freaking pen, uh, because I'm just going to have to invest in a amazing pen. Uh, this pen is just not up to my standards. Um, I'm going to abbreviate. So this is, you do not abbreviate. You do not do that. You write down the whole shebang, the whole word. Okay. Um, do not, do not abbreviate. I think you know that already. You guys are smart kids. Um, so, excuse me. You guys are smart young adults. Excuse me. So the two present is crocodiles. I'm going to just call them crocs. <laughs> and birds. Let's see if this can work. Birds. Okay. <laughs> so then it asks, but that's not it. Notice how you just get one point. You have to make sure you describe how they may have been able to survive to uh, to the present day. How do animals survive the changing environment? They adapt, okay? They adapt. I'm just trying things here and see. Nope, just chicken scratchings. They adapt. They adapt to their changing environment, okay? They survived disease. They survived um, short resources finite resources they they were able to adapt to their changing environment that is the best answer you can give simple you do not have to reinstate the question that it, it the regents just doesn't give you enough lines and for those overachievers that you start writing your answers on the side booklet be very careful you want to make sure that the teacher knows what um that the teacher that's grading your paper can understand your answers and see it clearly now moving on Let's keep going. Okay. So, again, I really think that you're going to be good with multiple choice. I'm telling you this. I'm not going to go through multiple choice for this video for time's sake. It's going to be 2 in the morning soon. I want to upload this video as soon as I can. So, I'm going to um, work with the short responses. All right. Here we have a reproductive system, female reproductive system question. If you've seen my videos before, I think you'd be able to answer this on your own. Pause the video, look at the questions and see if you can answer it on your own, then play and then see how it plays out for me, uh, for us together, all right? So I'm gonna get my pen back. Base your answers to questions 50 through 52 on the diagram below and on your knowledge of biology. The diagram indicates some parts of the human female reproductive system. This is why it's so important for you guys not to miss anything that is on this sheet of paper because some other students could just be like, what the heck is this? Is this a deer? Is this an x-ray of some kind of extraterrestrial? No, it's the female reproductive system. I know it looks like a deer. Um, and it is, and it tells you right in the directions. So, um, again, do not look at the questions, look at the diagram and what they're pointing and just say things out, well, not out loud, but say things in your head. This is a female reproductive system. A is pointing to the fallopian tube. B is pointing to one of the two ovaries. C is pointing to the uterus. D is pointing to the vagina, also known as birth canal. Let's think about functions. You have three hours. Take your time. Your friends are starting to leave to get their bacon, egg, and cheese outside. They gave up. They're finishing. They quote-unquote finished early. Forget about it. You are staying the three hours or whatever time it takes for you to do this test the right way. Because some of you are complaining, I keep failing, I keep failing. Well, you're probably not concentrating and taking your time on the questions. Sit down. Take a quick break, come back, ask to go to the bathroom, come back, and work, 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 okay? So, function A, fallopian tube. This is where the egg waits for fertilization. It waits for the sperm to get fertilized. And once the sperm and egg meet here, 
okay? Then that's fertilization. Fertilization happens here. B, this is an ovary. This is where oogenesis happens. This is where meiosis happens, sex cell division. This is where eggs grow. And when do females get eggs? When there are fetuses, when your mom was a baby inside, a fetus inside of your grandmother's womb, that's when she made all the eggs that she needs for a lifetime. The menstrual cycle and ovulation is when a matured egg pops out of the ovary and it makes its way to the fallopian tube. It could be this ovary, it could be this one, or it could be both. Um, and a weight on in the fallopian tube for that sperm to come through. C is the uterus. What happens in the uterus? This is where the child grows, guys. This is where a baby grows um, with the placenta that is attached to the uterus of a female, okay? The uterus, the umbilical cord, the amniotic sac, and the baby. The, the placenta supplies nutrients to the baby as well, the fetus, I'm sorry, as well as it removes any toxins that um, the child is producing. The blood of the baby and the blood of the mother never mix. Um, once it is ready to be born, it is the baby is extracted by muscular contractions of the uterus out of the birth canal okay so this is what they label they didn't label anything else so let's see what the questions are 50 the structure in which fertilization normally takes place is where hello fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube which is a thank you very much say one function of organ b organ b produces what produces eggs it produces eggs my th that's it that's it okay don't get fancy state one advantage of internal development for the human embryo so why is it a good thing that a child a baby grows inside of a mother's um uterus think about it okay before i give you the answer why is it important for a fetus to grow um, inside as opposed to outside. For protection of the environment, protection of weather, protection of predators, protection of disease, protect, it, it's, the baby is protected by all of the dangers that are outside the, on the outside world. Um, the, the fetus is also given nutrients from the mother to the child through the placenta if you want to get fancy there but notice how it just says one just give one do not reinstate the question this is not an ela exam it doesn't they you do not have to be fancy but answering complete sentences please use correct grammar and make sure that you write like you are writing to the president of the united states okay like you are writing to someone very important that you are writing to get someone out of a ransom no i don't know so you have to write clear because if the teacher cannot understand what you're saying you don't get the point you do not get the point okay all right so let's move on okay here we have an ecology section so this one so a lot of my students forgot what this is called. Let me get my pen back. This is, you got to look again at the entire diagram. Here is the past. I'm trying here. Maybe is that I have to, this thing like script? Oh, hell no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't have time for that. This is the past. This is the future. This means that in the past, this area used to be nothing but grass, a grass stage. And as time went by, then you got shrubs, then you got pine forest stage, and then you got a whole forest, a whole ecosystem. This is called succession. Succession. Identify the ecological process that is represented from stage A through stage D. Succession. But 
In order to get the point, you got to explain why each stage is important to the stage that follows. So explain why each stage is important to the stage that follows because each stage is making it, is preparing for the next stage. Each stage modifies the environment for the next stage. Each stage makes the environment more suitable for the replacement community. So you see how you started with nothing? Well, guess what? These trees and this kind of pine forest stage is going to attract more animals, is going to attract more insects, is going to attract more birds, rabbits, worms, more insects, more plants, more seeds falling to the grass and making making more trees. So it makes it more suitable for the replacement um, community, okay? Okay, here we go. The difference between abiotic and biotic. Abiotic, don't even look at the question. This is something that we emphasize as teachers when we teach you guys. Abiotic and biotic. Abiotic are things around you that affect living things that are not living. And what makes things living? Cells. If it does not have cells, it is not living. Do not say a chair is abiotic because it's not living. A pencil is not living because it's ab. It's it's ab. So it's abiotic. Think about things that life is affected by. The air. What is in our air? Is the air living? No, it's a gas. The the air has to have oxygen and nitrogen. It has to have oxygen in order for us to breathe in and go through our process of cellular respiration and make ATP energy. Um, biotic factors are living. Oh, let me let me continue with abiotic. Abiotic, oxygen, nitrogen, temperature, the sun, solar energy, water, the quality of water, pollution. These are all abiotic factors. Biotic factors are living things, animals, algae, bacteria, living things, um, plants. Those are biotic. Bio, bio means living. Okay, I'm giving up on my pen. Okay, so this says... Um, identify two abiotic factors that can determine which types of organisms can inhabit an ecosystem. Okay, notice how this is kind of referring to the whole topic of succession. So two non-living things, non-living factors that can determine which types of organisms can inhabit an ecosystem. You could put temperature and levels of oxygen. You can put Again, abiotic, non-living. Don't put levels of oxygen and then types of plants because plants is biotic. It's living. Plants are living. Okay? Don't put insects. Don't put prey. Don't put... No, because that's biotic. Prey is an animal and that is a living thing. So you can put temperature. You can put the, the quality of the water, the, the purity of the water, the level of salt in the water. Um, you can put anything, anything, the minerals found in the soil, anything that is that affects living things is that is abiotic non-living. Okay? 55. Identify the short-term effect that a forest fire during stage D would have on the biodiversity of the area. So there's a fire. First of all, what is biodiversity? Okay. Biodiversity is having diversity, living things that are different, different species, different kind of living things. So you have plants, you have birds, you have bees, you have... um algae, you have bacteria, you have bears, you have lions, you have fish, you have dolphins, biodiversity, a diverse amount, different types of living things. So we know that this niche, this environment is going to have a 
to, is going to have a, a particular type of biodiversity. You're not going to have dolphins here. Dolphins belong in the ocean. And that ocean life is going to have its different type of biodiversity. So it's saying, identify the short-term effect that a forest fire uh, during stage D would have on biodiversity um, of the area. If there's a forest fire, it's going to kill animals, so the biodiversity will decrease. Decrease. Many trees and animals will no longer be present. Common sense, guys. Common sense. Don't leave things blank. Don't give up. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Let's keep let's keep going. Okay. We're going to start getting into some weird questions that I don't like. But guys, if you've already seen my previous videos and you look at this one, look at all the similarities the questions that keep coming up but in different form or sometimes just straight up the same. Okay, so let's start. 56 and 57, so these two have to do with um, this reading passage. Can you just say how lucky you are that you don't have to read a whole page of, of literature? This is reading comprehension, okay? Remember to annotate, underline, write notes on the side and try to just kind of figure out what they're going to ask without reading the question. Okay, turtle cells and human skin. Okay, new research has demonstrated that turtles and humans may have had a common ancestor 310 million years ago. How awesome is that, that we might have ancestors that were turtles? Goodness gracious. A recent study looked at the genes responsible for the skin layers of turtle shells compared to the genes for human skin. Okay, so this little study is looking at turtle shells and how it compares genetically to human skin. Genetically meaning the DNA, what makes you you, the DNA molecule that is inside of your nucleus, inside of your cells. The findings of the study suggest that about 250 million years ago when turtle evolution split from other reptiles, a mutation in a specific group of genes occurred. A mutation is when your DNA is changed somehow. If it's a different letter, if it's a substitution, if it's an inversion. The basic organization of this group of genes is similar in turtles and humans, and they produce the important skin proteins that produce shells in turtles and protect against infection in the skin of humans. Remember that the cells make proteins by protein synthesis. Okay, so identify the molecule that contains hereditary material and the organelle in which it is found. Listen, I'm going to stop right here and say we didn't even have to read that passage. Don't you go and not read things, though. My pen's going crazy. Don't you dare skip the reading, and f even if you find out you didn't even need to read it. This is all memorization this is all hopefully your teacher taught you about the cell and the cell function and the organelles and organelle functions so for number 56 identify the molecule that contains the hereditary material hereditary material is what molecule what makes you who you are what do you inherit from your parents d n a where is dna found in the nucleus it doesn't matter if it's a turtle, a whale, a, a, anything. Every living thing that has cells, a eukaryotic cell that has organelles is going to have a nucleus. And in that nucleus is where you find your hereditary material, which is called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Don't do that. Don't do deoxyribonucleic acid. You might misspell it so bad that they might not give you the point. As easy as that, guys. I, I you you should not get thrown off that it's from a turtle. Turtles are gonna have the same structure, molecular structure, um, an anatomical structure of the cell because they're living things and cells are all pretty much the same with the same organelles. Okay, 57. Describe how the mutation in the genes of a turtle ancestor turned out to be a beneficial evolutionary adaptation. So they're saying, why is it that the DNA mutated and then the turtle was able to have something good for itself? So 
The turtles produced a protein that strengthened skin, resulting in a tough shell for a defense mechanism. So you could say the whole reasons why why um, turtles have a hard shell is because of this mutation. That's freaking awesome. Turtles are able to protect themselves from predators because of the hard shell. They hide in it. Um, they're able to protect themselves from environmental factors, from the sun, from being attacked, all of these things. It's two o'clock. Two o'clock in the morning, guys. Oh my goodness. All for you. All for you. Okay? So that's 56 and 57. Don't get stuck. Take your time. Oh, bats. Do me a favor. When you're done with this video and you want to relax and you want to see some cute, cute bats, type it in YouTube, ASMR bats, and click on a lady that she looks like she ha she's like this gorgeous old lady with these beautiful um, eyes that, that look like they're reptilian. Um, she is a bat master. She's, you can call her bat woman. It's okay. And the, it's just so relaxing and so beautiful. And those bats are beautiful. Anyways, back to this side, side thing. Um, so here we have numbers 58 through 60. Ooh, 58, 53 pointer. The little brown bat. Okay, base your answers to questions 58 through 60 on the illustration and information below and on your knowledge of biology. The little brown bat, here we go. The illustration is of a species commonly called the little brown bat. It has 38 teeth and usually lives near bodies of water. The animal is considered beneficial by many people because it eats mosquitoes and many types of garden pests. They feed at night, detecting their prey by echolocation, a form of sonar similar to what is used on ships. They can determine the location and size of their prey by listening to the return echo. So echolocation is when, I'm just getting my pen, there it is. So they're gonna make a noise and those wavelengths I guess it's drawing slower. Those wavelengths, let's let's say that you are standing here. I said this is you. Let's see if anything happens. Ooh, that turned out pretty good. And this bat is sending out, is making a noise, and the echolocation gets to you and then it bounces back to the bat, and then the bat knows that you're there and knows the size. That's absolutely phenomenal. It's good to read and then kind of tell yourself the story in your head, and then go to the questions. The little brown bat eats mainly mosquitoes and night flying insects. State one way in which the animal is adapted to prey on these organisms. They adapted to prey on these organisms at night because of echolocation. This is a very free, this is a, this is basically a free point right here. The answer to 58 was in the reading. A lot of times this happens. They were able to adapt by, by echolocation. Okay. Um, it can catch, uh, these insects because it can fly. That's another thing. Insects, the, the mosquitoes fly and it flies. It uses echolocation. It has 38 teeth. It has large ears so that it can hear the insects because it feeds at night. It feeds near bodies of water where mosquitoes breed. Like it's it's more, it, it, as long as your answer makes sense, it's correct. 59, if a mutation occurs in some of these bats, it may result in a new inheritable trait that makes them better able to catch insects than other bats in the population. Describe what will most likely happen to the frequency of the original trait in the population to support your answer. So they develop, they develop some kind of trait that makes them better at catching insects. So what would happen to the trait before that? So the frequency of the original trait will decrease because if they're succeeding with the new one, Natural selection, survival of the fittest, if you have a trait that makes you um, adapt to your changing environment, 
if you changed and made yourself better, that past trait is going to go away. The frequency is going to decrease. Hello. Okay. Let me take my pen away again. 60. Coevolution. Hmm. Interesting word. Coevolution occurs when the evolution of an adaptation by one species affects the evolution of an adaptation in a second species. Very interesting. I like how they gave you the definition of coevolution in the case you didn't know. Some species of moths have evolved the ability to emit high frequency sounds that can block the little brown bat's echo echolocation. Based on the information provided, explain how this relationship between moths and bats is an example of coevolution. Very good. After the bats evolved at um, echolocation, some moths evolved a way to block it. So that's something that you can say that um, bats evolved how to echolocate and some moths as some moths evolved a way to block that echolocation so that the bats don't recognize that they're there. Bats that, another answer could have been, bats that had adapted to find and eat moths by using echolocation led to the evolution of moths that could block these signals. And that was also in the reading, guys. You get my drift. Okay, next. Here we have some kind of data table. And um, before you go to the questions, read and look at everything, including notes, including this. The next series of questions is where my students scored lowest on because my students just didn't like to read certain, um, not, not this past year, this past year, this group was very hardworking. Um, I don't say smarter because every single student is smart in my eyes and it's more about are you going to work harder on the question are you not are you going to get lazy with the question you're not it's about work ethic it's about stamina of a test as well okay so let's see koalin kaolin <laughs> as a spray to control a bean pest spray kaolin a clay like material on the leaves of plants has been affecting in reducing insect damage to, to plants that grow in, temp, in temperate regions but has not been tried in tropical areas. Researchers in the tropical Andean region of South America have recently conducted experiments to see if koalin can be used there to control the greenhouse whitefly, a significant pest of the region's bean crops. So they're just saying, can we use this, this natural spray to control this pest that's like really getting to our beans? In the study, four groups of bean plants were used to, with the following treatments. Okay, control means that there's no, just got a, a comment from Shanti. Don't worry, girl. I'm going to um, post very, very, very soon. It's 2.08 a.m. Um, so there's four different con four different groups. The first one did not get insecticide. It did not get sprayed whatsoever. And it killed none of the white flies that are affecting the beans. Group two got a synthetic chemical insecticide applied to it. Um, An insecticide is a poison. See, this is the part of that we hope that you were taught in the in the class. Um, insecticide is like a bug spray. It's a poison, like Raid, like you know, Blackjack. I don't know the names of, of you know roach sprays or bug sprays, but those are non natural and they're they're harsh chemicals and they could really um, affect your health. But 90% of the white flies were killed. So um, then you have another group that were sprayed, leaves treated with 2.5% concentration of koalin spray. 80% of those um, flies died. And then four, um, group four, uh, leaves treated with 5% concentration of koalin spray. So the, the, 
they increased the concentration, but still the same amount of white flies killed were killed. So the 2.5 and 5% didn't really make a difference. Um, but let's read the note because you have to read the note. In group four, the, pl the plants lost 40% less water and showed a 45% increase in chlorophyll content in the leaves. So it dehydrated the, um, the water for, for uh, significantly and it did increase the amount of chlorophyll that would increase the amount of photosynthesis happening, yay. So now that we first read, and understood the experiment and read the note. Now let's get into the questions. 61. Say one likely, likely effect of the white flies on the bean plants in the control group one by the end of the study support your answer. None of them died. They, they did not get sprayed of any insecticides and none of them died because 0% of white flies were killed. Period. It was right there. It's right here. Moving on. So let me just check. Let me just check to make sure that that was the correct answer. Since no pest control method was used, they were probably eaten to a much greater extent. Next, 62. Should the group three, okay, group three koalin treatments be considered as an acceptable alternative control method to the group two? insecticide treatment of white flies support your answer which data from the ch from the data with the chart so do you think that the more natural safer way of spraying is can be replaced from using bug spray like poisonous insecticide yes because even though it was lower than 90 percent 80 percent is still significant so that's what you would say. Yes, you can um, switch over to the kaolin uh, treatments because it killed 80% of the white flies and it's better for the environment. And the data, and that's what shows in the data table, 80%, 80% died. That's significant, that's a significant number. 63, based on the results of groups three and four, identify the quality treatment that would be best for bean plants grown in areas where low rainfall is a common occurrence. Support your answer. So let's read this again. Based on the results of three and four, remember this is where the note comes in. Remember that four loses 40% less water. So when you use four, 5% concentration, the plants lose water, they get dehydrated, but they get more chlorophyll. So they're saying, um, identify the quality treatment that would be best for bean plants grown in areas where low rainfall is common. You're gonna use three. You're gonna use 2.5% of concentration of the quality spray. Notice what I'm doing. You're not, listen guys, this question is not going to be on the test in a couple of hours in the August test. It's, it doesn't work that way. But notice what I'm doing. I am reading and understanding the experiment first. I'm looking and seeing what is this data table telling me. I am also painting a fun picture in my head. Then I go to the question and I answer it based on this. So if they're saying which one is better for a place that doesn't have rain you're not going to choose four because the four treatment um dehydrates them they need water they need rain so you're going to choose three three is the best treatment in a place that has low rainfall because it does not get dehydrated like it does of treatment four the plants would die 64. State one reason why the scientists are interested in reducing white fly populations in Andean region. So, because they, they are a significant pest of the region's bean crops. The reason why they want to reduce the white fly is because they are attacking the bean crops. That was such an easy one point giveaway. That answer, like all of these answers are in, were in the data table in the reading. Okay, so this, um, video just hit an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip to part D. Part D is where you have 
those four mandated lab regions um, questions. Go back to my channel if you haven't looked at them before. I need for you to look at them um, at, at that video. That video is um, <clears throat> about the four mandated regions, the relationships and biodiversity, the diffusion through a membrane, beaks of finch, and making connections. You were supposed to do those four labs in order for you to take this test. If you did not do those four labs, then your teacher did not do what she, he or she was supposed to do to get you prepared for this test because part D is all about those four um, labs, including lab safety, including the microscope and other things as well, okay? Um, let's go straight to the short responses. 77 is the four, first one. 77, a student was setting up beakers that contained different solutions in order to conduct a laboratory investigation. But the next day, he could not tell which beaker contained the starch and water mixture. In order to find out which beaker contained starch, he took a small sample from each of the beakers and conducted a test for starch on each of them. Describe the test of starch that the student should use and the result that would indicate the presence of starch. Okay, guys, I'm going to try my, my pen again. Um, what is this? Let me see if I could, maybe it works better if I increase it and then capture, hide cursor when writing. Okay. Um, this one is diffusion. Ah. Oh. No, still. Diffusion through a membrane. This is when you had a beaker and you filled it with water and you made this bag and inside this bag you put glucose and starch and outside here in the water you put iodine and the iodine diffused into the bag and the glucose diffused out of the bag. The glucose diffused out because it was small enough to fit through the porous membranes of this bag called dialysis tubing. The iodine went in because it was small enough to fit in. It touched the starch and it indicated starch was present, so it turned this whole thing dark black. And then the starch did not leave the bag because the starch molecules are too big to fit through the dialysis tubing. So describe the test for starch that students should use and the result that would indicate the presence of starch. The student would take iodine and place it on the samples and see if it turned dark, if it changed color, if it turned a dark purple, if it turned black. If starch is present, it turns a dark color that's what you want to put and that's always something that they're going to ask about that particular lab diffusion through a membrane you should have gotten a copy of your lab um now it's okay that you didn't do the lab because this is the summer and it's an august exam but it it was necessary for the teacher to go over these labs okay 78 in order to survive in its environment a single-celled organism used a contractile vacuole to remove excess water that diffuses into, this, into its cell. Another species, the hydra, also excretes excess water. Both processes involve the use of energy. Fine. Based on this answer, state whether these two organelles live in fresh water or salt water support your answer. Okay. Um, so you might have to read this a couple of times. Why? This is the end of the test. Things are getting a little bit complicated here, and you're probably getting tired. Number 78, and then this is also short responses, okay? So think about it. So fresh water, water would move in and they would need to remove and or excrete it. Okay, that's one of the answers. Fresh water. In fresh water, the water would be diffusing into them all the time and would need to be pumped out in order to maintain homeostasis. You can also say that. Another answer is fresh water. 
if they are pumping out excess water, it is because water is diffusing into them from an area with higher concentration of water. This means that the outside of the environment would be fresh water. So this again has to do with diffusion through a membrane when you had an onion and you added salt water and then the um, purple onion cells shrank the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, because salt went in and water went out, it got dehydrated. And then you added, um, you added, diff uh, then you added filtered water or distilled water and then it came back to life. It plumped up again and some, and some cells actually popped. All right, next question. We have biochemicals here. We have glucose, which you'll always know because it has this ring, and sucrose which is another different type of sugar. Say one reason why a glucose molecule is more likely than a sucrose molecule to diffuse through an artificial membrane. Remember that size matters. This is much larger than this. Sucrose is a much larger molecule than glucose. So that means that glucose is smaller and will fit through this artificial membrane in comparison to the sucrose. This is about size, guys. Okay, um, remember that Charles Darwin observed all these different animals in the Galapagos Islands. I don't think that you're gonna have a question um, so particular like this one, um, but again, go through it, see if you can answer it. I'm just getting really, really um, worried about time. It's over an hour. I wanna make sure that this was under an hour so that you could just watch this in the morning and then because you know how the morning is even though it's an afternoon exam the morning just flies by i really suggest that you wake up early hopefully a lot of you are sleeping right now okay next part d question as fish are frozen for storage the water in the cells expands as it cools from four four wait wait four four degrees celsius to zero degrees celsius and may cause cells to burst this lowers the quality of the fish. Explain how soaking the fish briefly in salt water before freezing them might prevent this damage to cells. Again, of what I was talking about before, okay? So soaking fish briefly in salt water will reduce the water content in the cells, allowing space for the remaining water to expand when it freezes. So the fish cells will lose water so they won't burst, okay? It's the same thing as before. The beaks of finches. Now, again, I'm not going to scroll down because we have to make sure that we understand what this is all about. Okay, I'm going to get started here. This is our last question of the video. Woo! Again, hopefully you've seen my other videos. Um, so, variations in beaks of Galapagos. Okay, so this is called the Galapagos Island Beach. Uh, um, Galapagos Island Beak Finch Wheel. In order for you to know their beaks, how they work, and what their diet is, you have to know that you start from the outside. So let's say I want to know all about the vegetarian finch. The vegetarian finch, okay, the beak looks like this. The biting, it has a biting tip on the top. It has a grasping bill. The bill is on the bottom. And it mainly eats plant food. So this vegetarian finch has a biting tip, grasping bill, and it mainly eats plant food. Okay, fine. Well, let's get a different one. Let's look at the wobbler finch. The wobbler finch has a very, this is the way the beak looks, has a probing beak and a probing bill, and then it eats 100% animal food, meaning that it eats animals, meaning that it's a carnivore Vegetarian finch is an herbivore, eats mainly plants. Warbler finch eats animal food. If they lived in the same area, which is such a common question, if they, if the vegetarian finch and the warbler finch lived in the same niche, in the same area, can they be together? Would they be competing? They will not be competing. They will not. Because they have, they eat different foods. How could they eat? How could they compete with each other if they don't eat the same food? One eats plants, the other one eats 
animals so happy family. But if the vegetarian finch lived with the large ground finch, they would compete with each other because they eat the same food. Now, don't say they won't compete because one lives in the, in the ground and the other one might live somewhere else. No. They eat the same food, so they're going to compete. Identify one finch population that would be negatively affected if the birth rate of small tree finches increased. So let's look at the small tree finch. Annotate, underline, small tree finches here. If this small tree finch were to increase in, in, in number, so you have like a million of these birds now, which finch population would negatively be affected? Think about it. Let's think about it. Look at what they eat. What does a small tree finch eat? It eats mainly animal food. So you have to choose a finch that also eats mainly animal food because look, small finch, follow the wheel, follow the wheel, and it eats mainly mainly plant uh, animal food. Now, you have to choose a finch that also eats mainly animal food because if it also eats mainly animal food, then it's competing with all these small tree finch that, you know, that are now eating the same food and the resources are going down. So your answer could be large tree finch. Support, remember, you have to have both parts because the large tree finch also eats mainly animal food. Okay, so now you, your answer could have also been the woodpecker finch. Support, because this um, the woodpecker finch also mainly eats animal food, okay? Last question. This one pissed me off. You know why? Because all this time we've been getting averages and I never is 13 and you got numbers 11 and 11. What you can do is you can start if, okay, so if two of your numbers is 11 and your average is 13, then you know that that number has to be higher than 11. It can't be 11. Because if you take the average of 11, 11, 11, 11 plus 11 plus 11 is 33 divided by 3, because that's how many number trials you have, it's going to be 11. So you're going to push it up. So you're going to start with plugging in 12. How much is, I don't want to show you a formula and whatever you're going to forget. Just plug in numbers. Make That makes sense. So do 11 plus 11 plus 12 divided by 3, what does that give you? And keep going until you get 13%. So the answer, actually pause the video, get a calculator, plug in, um, get the average by plugging in um, numbers as you go along. So 11 plus 11 plus 12 divided by 3, what is that? 11 plus 11 plus 13, what does, okay, so you got to go higher. So the answer is... If you pause it, it's 17. 11 plus 11 plus 17 divided by 3 gives you an average of 13. All right, guys, it is 2.37 a.m. For those of you who skipped through the beginning, again, um, I just got my internet back at 1 in the morning. I had to go to Target to pick up a router because my router didn't work. The technician that was promised to be at my home at 5 p.m. did not show because um, for whatever reason, melted in the rain because it's made out of sugar, I don't know. But I was not able to get internet service and I did this for you. Um, hopefully you saw my other videos as well. Um, that this is not the only video, this is just some of the big questions that I feel we needed to go through for June 2019. You can do this, guys. Wake up early, um, watch my videos, go through an exam, be prepared, eat lunch, bring snacks, do whatever it takes to make yourself go through those three hours and do it confidently. Do not leave any questions blank. Short responses are written in pen. Do not write sloppy. Sit up straight. Do not take a nap. If you take a nap, say goodbye to 15 to like 50 points of the test. I've had students that slept through the whole exam wake up crying because they no one woke them up. 
the proctor, the teacher in the room is not going to wake you up. They'll, they'll try, but if you don't wake up, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to do anything. It depends on the school, depends on the person. So push yourselves. This is your graduation. This is for you, your diploma. You're getting closer and closer and closer. Good luck, guys. Um, let me know how you do if you passed. I hope that um, it's a success for you. If you fail again, this is your third, fourth time taking and you failed again and my videos are not do not suffice, don't worry. This year, this academic year, I'm going to be making a website that allows you to get detailed all year round um, lessons that is not short. So you're gonna have a whole course given to you um, in this special website. You do have to pay, um, but it's not gonna be some crazy fee. It's gonna be very affordable. We're city kids. What 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 do I expect from you? Unless your parents can afford can afford a bundle, um, but you might not need a bundle. So um, if you fail again, don't worry. We can try again and again and again until you get it. Don't give up. And don't let failures um, define who you are. Just try again, guys. Good luck. Good luck. Pass. Bye. Thanks for watching my videos, guys.